and we are on here we go just give people a couple of minutes to join um, and then I'll do an introduction. I'm just going to share into the event because we've gone live on the page and not the event and I don't want anybody to miss it. Yeah. So I'm just going to copy the link. Okay, it's 22 people there already. So people have been waiting for you, Bobby. I told you, we were all really excited. Yay. <laughs> right, there we go. Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. God, there's loads of you. Um, we're really excited about tonight. I've been so excited because I've never heard the term exposure anxiety before. So when Bobby approached me, I was desperate to say, yes, please join us and do a presentation. Um, so this is Bobby. She runs the page um, Neurodiversity, Autism and Support. Is that what it's called, Bobby? Oh, That's yeah. The title. yeah. Um, so go over and um, give her page a like when you finished here. And if you can please ask any questions on the Nurture Programme page, I will pop over to the other pages that this is streaming on and check, but the main page that we are looking on at the moment is the um, Nurture Programme. So please ask, um, if you're on any of the other pages, come over to the Nurture Programme page, we'll see you there and that's where we'll be chatting in the comments. So, over to you, Bobby. Hi. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm good. I have to be yeah. really honest, nervous. So if I do this quite fast, um, do jump in and tell me to slow down. Yeah. You will be absolutely fine, whichever way you want to do it. I realized that um, the other day when, <laughs> when me and Laura done the live with Christy Forbes, <laughs> I sounded like I was on speed. I was talking so fast and I, I don't normally, I, well, I don't know if I normally do that, but I realized like half, I think I was so excited to like talk and, and what she was saying was so relatable that I was just like, oh my God, yes. <laughs> so yeah, we, we don't mind. Um, we, any, if anybody misses anything, if you're too speedy, they can go back and have another look. So it will be on the page at all times. Um, exactly, cool. Um, a bit of background about myself, if you want. Yeah, that would be amazing. Thank you. Okay, well, um, as most of you can tell, I'm American. I haven't lost the accent. I've been over here almost 27 years, but um, haven't really lost it. Um, two children, a wonderful husband, married 28 years, 27 years, 27 years. Um, my youngest is autistic. And it's through that journey that I realized that I probably am as well but it took me about 16 years to get to that point. Um, but through the journey of learning about, wanting to know more about my child, um, I sort of took every course, read every book, and that kind of led me to um, University of Birmingham, um, a degree. And the autism degree there is taught by a lot of the people that are involved or autistic themselves. So it was mind blowing and really, really eye-opening. Um, but right before I sort of did my degree is the first time I read a book called Exposure Anxiety, The Hidden Cage by um, John Williams. But I know her as Polly, Polly Samuels, actually. Um, and it was through um, that book and I came to learn about the type of autism that my youngest presented with. There's no other, I, I forgive the words, but it's hard to, to sort of because I don't think exposure anxiety exists outside of autism. I think it's part of the autism profile, but I don't think everybody who has autism experiences this. So I reached out to Polly um, through, oh, I can't remember how, probably email was that long ago. Um, and back and forth, we, we kind of became friends and she was kind of instrumental in pretty much understanding my child. Um, and this work, this work about exposure anxiety, um, I've come in contact with, I'll say, albeit rarely, um, but a few other autistic people I know um, and children I've worked with have had this kind of profile for a lack of putting a word to it. So that kind of brings me to where we are today. Um, 
Polly when she passed away, sadly, um, three years ago of um, breast cancer. Um, of right before she passed away, we were talking about possibly doing some more work in collaboration with exposure anxiety, because I really saw it could go further than yeah. just the book. So um, I guess this is the first part of that, pretty much. Wonderful. That's amazing. So sorry to hear about your friends, though. Very sad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, another thing that's interesting is Polly also had vascular um, Ehlers-Danlos. Which, okay. yeah, you know, I mean, that's kind of another way we bonded because I have Ehlers Danlos, not vascular. Mm -hmm. Thank God. I mean, vascular is probably the most extreme form of it. Yeah. But we really bonded through that. And um, she was very interested in to see how autism and Ehlers Danlos sort of crossed over. So she'd be proud because there's more research coming out now. And I often think of her when I read that research. Sorry. Yeah. She, she's going to be forever in your memory, popping up all over the place because of the work that she's done and the work that you're doing. Yeah, yeah absolutely amazing. Definitely. So I'm, I'm ready whenever you are. Perfect. Can you remember how to share your screen? Yep. Lovely. I'll uh, turn my camera off um, and manage the comments and direct people over here. And yeah, exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Now, um, bear with me a moment while we go into slideshow and from the beginning. Right, um, and that's probably not the screen. Um, sorry, uh, Jody, can you tell me which screen you're seeing? If you're seeing the presenter screen or you're seeing the main one? I'm seeing the presenter screen. Hey Okay, that's what I was afraid of. So let's swap and see if that works. Because I've got a, I've got a two um, display here. Yeah. Are you still seeing the duh? You're still seeing it. Yeah, you are. Okay. Mm. Can you click in display settings? So next to end slideshow, if you go to display settings. All I'm seeing is screen sharing is pause, stop share, resume share. Um, so on, on your screen, so yeah. not the, um, not the zoom part. If you look on your dashboard at the top, it says end slideshow, or you can click display settings. No, let me just stop the share for a second. Give me a second. Sorry, guys. Sorry. sorry, sorry. Take your time. So now if I rush this, I will get it wrong. So slideshow. Okay, I think I've got it now. Now, are you seeing the right one? Um, share the screen and then I'll be able to. Oh, geez, I didn't do the share screen part. That would be helpful. <laughs> I swear to God, <laughs> my friends out there right now are laughing themselves silly. I promise you. So, that one. How about now? Yep. Perfect. Amazing. Woohoo! We're there. We're there. Right. So, exposure anxiety. Excuse me while I take a drink because we've got dry, dry mouth now from freaking out slightly. Right. Okay. So, Donna Williams, as I said before, she was the reason that I got into this. I wanted to give you a little bit of background about Donna. She was born in 63 in, in urban Australia. And she was formerly named Donna by her parents, but um, she actually referred to herself as Polly um, after the age of five. And then in 2015, she reverted back to it. So when I first met her, she was Donna, and then she became Polly. As I said, um, she had vascular ehlers danlos syndrome, and she passed, unfortunately, from breast cancer and metastasized and became terminal. One interesting point about Donna is that, or Polly, is that she um, suffered intense abuse about, as a child and she actually developed dissociative personality disorder, 
It's kind of one of the reasons why she reached out to me because when she saw, she asked me for a picture and I sent her a picture of myself with like you know, crazy hair and stuff. Um, and she remarked that one of her um, personalities um, and I probably would have become very good friends. So it, it, it makes me laugh, but it was one of the reasons why we sort of bonded to begin with. So um, in 65 years ago, we obviously don't have the autism, you know, sort of diagnosis that we have today. And nor did, we have, did they have the understanding. She was like, uh, assessed as um, psychotic and labeled disturbed. Um, and that always shocks me because what, if you go to YouTube now and see any of her videos or any or ever seen her present, <laughs> there was, you know, she was unbelievably intelligent and incredibly eloquent. Um, so I find it very strange to think that she was actually labeled psychotic, psychotic or disturbed. So anyway, finally in 91, she got her diagnosis of autism. Um, and at that point in 92, or about 91 to 92, she started writing a book. And that book became Nobody Nowhere. And that, if you've never read it, highly, highly suggest it. Because um, that talks about her early, early, early years and um, the, the unbelievable trauma that she faced and how she came come out the other end of it. Um, and, and then there's somebody somewhere, Color to the Blind, Everyday Heaven. You know, um, in the 90s, she was the subject of documentary. She wrote a textbook on autism. She's a qualified teacher, international public speaker, autism consultant, as well as a musician, poet, and artist. An artist. And I don't know if you looked on Facebook, that, that, but that picture of the Pegasus is one that she um, painted for me um, and sent me right before she passed. In 2000, she married her second husband, Chris Samuel, who I, I know, um, and who has allowed me to sort of continue on with her work. Because after she passed, I couldn't, even though we agreed, I couldn't do anything without sort of his blessing. So um, he did, thankfully. Anyway. Um, Donna also wrote Exposure Anxiety in 2003, and my youngest was born in about 2001, <laughs> yeah, 2001, um, so uh, you can imagine it wasn't there long after that I actually contacted, I read the book and then I contacted Donna, right, so um, what I found in, and what Donna found mainly at the time, and this, this is her quote, is that there's a considerable overlap between exposure anxiety and conditions such as pathological demand avoidance, um, and oppositional defiance disorder. And I'm starting to realize more and more there is definitely a crossover, but I'm still learning about PDA. Um, whereas I've had like 19 years of exposure anxiety. So I kind of know that a little bit more. So I'll be interested to see at some point when I understand both very well, how they work together or how they interact. So it's definitely still not a very well understood or known. Um, as I said, there's probably a crossover between um, PDA and it's extremely under-researched as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm almost thinking that it could be another category of the PDI profile, but without full research, we kind of really won't know for sure. There's only myself and another gentleman named Paul Isaacs, um, or Isaacs, who, who does this, who knows of it. And Paul is actually a colleague and a friend and he lives with exposure anxiety, uh, but he presents and he trains um, on, on that and as well as autism. And it's funny because when I reached out to Chris, um, uh, Polly's husband, um, she told me to get in contact with Paul. And um, I was like, wow, okay, I know Paul from many, from university and from you know seeing him about. Um, so we've, we've been in contact and it's my hope at some point, someday, that maybe even Paul and I can get together and possibly work on something a bit more. Anyway, so what is not EA? And I thought it was important to start with that. Um, so it's not that feeling that people get that you're in some place and you, you feel like somebody's staring at you, yeah, or you think somebody's looking at you. Um, that's a kind of a primal gene thing, um, as well as a perception type situation more so. Um, it's not this thing, and I looked them up to see what else was, you know, could have been considered kind of like exposure anxiety and this uh, scope to phobia, or the feeler of being stared at was new to me. I didn't even know that existed. but there you have it. Um, and then there's something else called the spotlight effect, but that's kind of like a, um, it's kind of like a cognition or a psychological bias that distorts your perception and it, and it makes you rely more heavily on your own perception than what is actually real. Um, and then 
it's also what EA is not, is it's more than social anxiety. It's not a social anxiety disorder. And by far, it's certainly not shyness. Um, so I wanted to point them out. Anyway, there's the Pegasus picture I was talking about. Um, so what is exposure anxiety? And I, I wanted to put uh, Polly's words um, in this specifically, because I thought this, this paragraph uh, of itself was quite telling. Um, so she says, the world expected me to respond. It, I gave it all the messages that it had invaded. I went into aversion, diversion, and retaliation responses. I stopped existing. I found strategies to tune out awareness, awareness of the environment, and of myself. It kind of freed things up again. The world didn't take a hint. When it watched too closely, everything seized up again. It was hard to breathe. Interception. Um, I couldn't connect to take myself to the toilet. I couldn't think. Eating before others was like doing a solo performance in the Albert Hall. Showing the need for the toilet was like bearing a huge vulnerability for those so eager, so waiting, hungry for purpose. They were like bears waiting outside the cave I was in. Hearing myself speak in my own voice is acknowledgement, acknowledge its connection to the world was excruciatingly personal and it felt like fingernails down a blackboard. The intense pain that was the personal individual meanness in it was unbearable. I was allergic to the experience of my own existence and the experience of hearing my own voice speaking from a connected, a personal expression to me was intolerable. It's kind of in, in, in intense, you know, if you think about it and, and that exposure anxiety affects all those senses and even her, her idea of selfness. So what is exposure anxiety? And that first sentence to me is, is everything. It's the excruciating sense of audience to one's own, own existence. And the result of that is compuls um, compulsive and involuntary retaliation, diversion, avoidance, aversion. And, but the big thing is for me and the difference with pathological demand avoidance is that it is not the perceived or unperceived demands. It's actually the attention and the perceived attention that's placed on them. And that results in almost a disconnection of, of self. So exposure anxiety is the invisible cage that challenges the person to either side with it, exposure anxiety, and therefore identify their self with their own compulsive self-protection responses or EA. So living with EA. Um, I put some points down here that um, were from my experience as well as a parent, as well as a professional. So um, in my experience, I found that Max, who is my youngest, and that's a pseudonym, um, would hold as a toddler until he was unseen, um, resisting all potty training, hide under tables. And Max couldn't be taught anything directly. Max would retaliate, divert, or avoid any attention. So there was no, there was no direct teaching. You couldn't directly teach the child. Um, and as for my, I had to pretend as everything was for myself. So I was pretending not to know how to do something. And I would be narrating it the whole way along um, as if talking to myself. Praise never worked. In fact, praise automatically triggered EA, which would be the retaliation. And that was often, often explosive, um, especially when very young, you know, um, say good job, Max, and you got smacked. Um, diversion or avoidance. And this effect in, affected a lot of areas. So it affected eating, drinking, changing clothes at school and outside the home, also affected hygiene. And I also wanna point out that the artwork there is by Max. So what else? You could not, you could not, if you were a teacher, you couldn't call on Max, okay? If you called on them or uh, directly questioned them, especially, especially in front of the group or in front of the class, um, unless Max, and even then it, it had to be one-on-one -on -one, and even on one-on-one, -on -one, they, they had to know you really, really well before um, that, that attention directed exactly on by calling on them or call, asking them a question um, would literally avoid, uh, trigger EA and, and, and trigger the you know, retaliation. Um, they would appear indifferent, uncaring, non-committed as it's easier than to show that you care. So I even had to pull up some 
school reports and some EHCPs and places where it was, you know, Max is indifferent. Uh, no, Max isn't indifferent. Max will appear indifferent because it's a lot easier than actually um, triggering those personal responses of showing that you care. Um, so there were no social family events, uh, definitely no birthdays, uh, too painful unless that person really, really understood and it was an extremely small gathering. Um, and that meant, you know, family birthdays as well as part of me going to birthdays. There was no student of the week, which kind of hate that thing anyway. And there definitely weren't any sticker charts or certificates and all of that stuff because it was guaranteed it would either be ripped up or thrown back in your face. Um, Max also could also almost instinctively know the motive of others. So if you were transparent and you're trying to teach, then Max could pick that up and you weren't going to get very far. <laughs> um, he also uh, he also felt as if others could actually really see their thoughts, like you know, like as if it was coming across the head. Um, that's how intense the sort of the intention, perceived attention on them was. And to this day, doesn't like names or photos or any mention um, in anywhere. So you you won't find Max online unless it's sort of a gaming community and literally with his friends. Um, so. It was, it was, I, I want to go back to this part of, 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 of sort of looking indifferent because I think these kids get branded um, of being not caring or, or indifferent when, and it's so much easier to not care than to show that you care about anything. So, you know, when it, when it was, when, when Max was younger, it was, I don't know, I don't know. Now it's, I can't be bothered. And that, that in our household means that EA is being triggered, that something is, is it's too much attention and then that everybody sort of needs to back off a little bit. So, okay, living with EA. Another artwork by Max, thank you. <laughs> I'm so proud. Um, learning is best when it's motivated and self-directed. And I think this is very simple, similar, similar to pathological demand avoidance from what I know as well. Um, you know, there's, there's no attention placed. So there's, you know, there's no demands in that respect. Um, and that way, I think it could be very, very similar. Um, social interaction has to be on their terms and trust is imperative not to trigger EA um, because they're automatically assuming, or at least Max was automatically assuming that all eyes were always on all the time. Um, and, and, and this, this, uh, excuse the expression, um, uh, BS detector, I'll be, I'll be PC about it, um, and being on authentic, honest, and not patronizing. Um, a match would see literally right through it and would assume that, that you were trying to con um, Max into learning something. And it always had to be in an indirect um, uh, confrontational approach. And what, what I mean by indirect and direct is, 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 for some of you that may not realize, the direct approach would be 100% ABA, which in, in our home is um, kind of like a curse word. Um, but that that straight up in your face, sit down in front of me, let me teach you something. Um, obviously that's directly confrontational. In, indirect confrontational achieves its goals through progressively providing an involuntary avoidance diversion that are redundant. So you can't, you almost turn EA off. You can't retaliate, you can't divert, you can't avoid because in that, in that way, there's no audience observing, or at least there's no perceived audience observing. Um, there's no personal self to expose. Um, it seems it seems incidental. It seems by chance, you know, um, and it's completely impersonal. You have to take the kind of person out of everything in that respect. Um, and it's via sometimes via an object, which I'll get into a little bit later, which is easily um, rejected, you know, um, it's, it's kind of doesn't trigger EA as much when um, the confrontation is through an object versus through a person. And like I said, I'll get, I'll get into that a little bit later. But when, when taught experiences are in a way that doesn't actually reinforce EA, um, that the world isn't safe and they have to retaliate and avert, uh, divert and all of that, it challenges the idea that, uh, that EA is the identity. Because in, for Max specifically all along, EA has been saying to you, I am the only thing that protects you. I am the only thing that preserves you. I'm here for you 
and I will make sure nothing happens to you. But when I changed from a confrontational, not triggering EA to an in, in, indirect confrontational way, um, EA wasn't triggered. And, and to Max, that meant that actually EA wasn't the identity. EA wasn't always the one that was in control, if that makes sense. That EA wasn't there to protect, that sometimes EA was wrong. And that was quite important. So anyway, I wanna go into real, oh, another one, another one. I wanna go into some tips. And a lot of these tips were, were um, part Donna um, Polly, um, but sometimes I've, I've tweaked or updated them a little bit. So losing the audience is a really important. So if you're focused really strong on the person with the exposure anxiety, try to be less worried, less concerned, less desperate. And that's really hard sometimes to do because you are waiting, you know, you are sitting there, you're waiting, you're wanting for them. You want the best for the child, regardless if it's your own or somebody else's. You're working for them. You want the best for them. So you have to be less desperate for the change. The person can stop defending against the, in the, uh, the uh, invasion, thank you, of the pressure and the attention. So you have to reduce that feeling because they can perceive it. Max didn't, would know if I was waiting and wanting and watching. It was almost like it was on his skin. He could feel it. So that has to come down. Like I said, that's oh, a lot easier said than done sometimes. And also respecting the sanctity of the one on one on world. This is specifically from Polly and I thought it was brilliant. So be self-owning. That means communicating and participating as if you're doing it for your own benefit. When Polly told me that and helping out Max, that was literally life-changing in reference to the way we lived in the house. Um, and to enjoy yourself and be silly as if your own world, you know, that, that idea of dances that nobody's watching, you know, it's you and your child, your child is not going to be judging you. So, you know, let yourself go, have a little bit of fun. <coughs> Pardon me, the buffer zone. So this was also really important, which I also thought was quite interesting. So um, you communicate through objects, you made up characters, funny voices, but if it's for yourself. So for example, for Max, I don't know when it happened, where it happened. Well, one day I'm brushing my tooth and suddenly the toothbrush had a voice. And, you know, I'm talking to myself and I'm talking about brushing my, my teeth, but the toothbrush is saying about how I must not miss this tooth and that tooth and blah, 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 blah. It was hysterical. I have to say, I was like laughing myself silly, but it worked because the next thing I know, Max is picking up a toothbrush and going for it. So sometimes you remove that pressure of the attention by it's, it's, it's an object. So, and it, it, it's, it's demonstrating that indirect confront, confrontational way. Yeah, and it also makes it a little bit more way to communicate ideas and things because it's not coming from you. It's the attention of the child is not coming from you. It's an object, an object can be, you know, thrown away. It doesn't matter if that was, makes sense. So, and also it wasn't me. So I also use this one too. So the jacket is asked to be put on so it protects you from the rain. So attributing responsibilities to objects. So it's not me that wants you to put on your jacket, Max. Your jacket wants to go on because it wants to protect you from the rain. And when they're really small, it's perfect. It works, you know, because that's suspension of belief and, you know, fantasy land and this whole thing about, oh, they can't have imaginations, but, you know, Max had a vivid one. So this was easy. And again, it reduces that attention. You know, it's not me. And also it reduces the demand, which kind of makes me think about demand avoidance again, you know? But with EA, if you reduce the EA, the demand, demand automatically goes down as well. Anyway, so no equals yes and yes equals no. Um, again, Polly suggested this. So for, for eating especially, um, if, if it's extreme, that person cannot even eat in front of its own, you know, their own family members type thing. Um, she suggested try leaving little plates of food around for no one. It's for Mr. No One. You know, and that actually might entice them because it's no attention, there's no demand, there's no, it's just a plate of food. And if a child wants to go and investigate it, they can. Good cop, bad cop. Kind of use this myself in a way, I have to say. So when using the toilet as an issue, i.e. holder, do not uh, draw any attention to when they have. And that was really hard to do because the parents were kind of like, oh, they went to the toilet. It, no, not in our house. It didn't work that way. If he did that way, it was guaranteed he, he wouldn't do it again, you know, pretty much. Um, so you ha I had to ignore it. And, and you know, in, if in nappies, you make a big deal when they need to be changed, having them dispose of the contents in the toilet or, you know, 
putting it in an appy bag or whatever. And all that attention um, pretty much guaranteed, guaranteed, at least, excuse me, in a while for Max that suddenly he was going to the toilet. Okay, so build a one. Also really important because you get in the vibe and you get in that flow with the child and you're like, oh, this is going so good. Let's continue it forever. But you can't. You actually have to play hard to get. You have to keep the involvement in small doses, leaving them actually wanting more. You have to be the most fascinating, fascinating thing that this, they've seen. And that's when you get them in their proper flow. But you can't overdo it. You can't do it for too long. And you've got to know when to stop so that it actually means that they want more. And then it's kind of like this, this hook that keeps coming back. And also, uh, again, so the kind of a good pop, bad pop scenario. So if you want to promote something or teach something, it's, you have to ignore it in an obvious way. It's almost like literally the elephant in the room. It's right in the center of the room and you're pretending it's not even there. And if you want to inhibit something, be enthusiastic, invasive, and very social about it and very happy. You know, if you put on that, that whole thing I just did, that whole, mm, yeah, it drives me crazy. Patronizing, but it, as it is, but that over the top stuff pretty much guarantees the opposite's gonna happen. Okay, so disappear. When when it was really really hard to engage, um, Paul used this toy that was if it's hard to engage in something, singing, counting, tapping, using a rhythm, a non-invasive, as if you're doing it for yourself, might you know relieve some pressure. So if they were in a group and something was going on, they were doing timetables, whatever, she would literally pat it out on herself and then say the numbers. And she found that the child that she was working with would get distracted enough and into the rhythm enough that it would work. I haven't used it, so I'm just putting these up there as ideas. Yes, but, so when dealing with explosive or violent retaliation, do try as hard as possible not to react with no or don't. Again, it's the same thing. It, it sounds counterintuitive, but when you say, if you say something like gentle biting, it actually brings attention enough to it. You can figure out your own words, but it actually brings enough to it, uh, attention to it that it might just literally stop and cold. Yeah, because you're putting attention on it. Again, I haven't necessarily dealt with this um, in that respect. I've dealt with it different ways. Um, and I found that making a reaction that was loud enough saying ow pretty much stopped max cold and also get it wrong getting it wrong i got things wrong so many times i can't tell you how stupid i was as a parent when max was shot really dumb um but setting up situations where child feels compared to correct things complete something that's undone it's a brilliant tool you know like half done stuff especially for somebody who's a part perfectionist like max was as he got older you know, like it compelled him to do it. Um, it also can be used to initiate voicing out loud to yourself what you do not, that you do not know how to do a simple task. Like, I don't know how to film this glass with water. I forgot completely how to do it, etc. So, and tough luck. Um, it also really hard, but I think it, it goes with any child, um, neurodivergent child, any kind of codependent uh, codependency can make it worse than defending those who are trying to help. So it, it becomes a way to almost disappear. It, it, you, it almost, it's that I can't bother. I can't be bothered. You know, if I can't do it for myself, so I'm gonna let you do everything for me, almost. It, it can become, even though the attention's there of somebody constantly doing it, it the codependency becomes so strong that it's if the, the person with EA loses themselves and the person it's doing for them. And it can continue. Don't be so quick to jump in every time and don't be afraid to forget and become completely incapable of doing something. I've got a lot of links here, which I'm happy to give um, um, out um, as a PDF possibly, um, because this is, this is kind of my work and I don't really want to mess with. And also um, information about me. And that's it. Jody, we're done. Jody? Jody? Hello. Oh, God, you scared me for a minute there. I'm thinking, like, did any of that go out? I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't find my, um, 
my little window, but oh, brilliant! Wow, that's amazing. Oh, that freaked me out for a second. I seriously thought I've been talking to myself. No, no, no. We've all been watching. We've all been watching. So let's have a look. Let's see where the comments are. Somebody mentioned in the comments that it sounds like there's a huge overlap with EA and PDA. Yeah, absolutely. And when, that's what I was trying to say, like, like for, 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 for Max, um, when, when, it, when attention is placed on Max, then the, the, that, that's like a demand and it becomes like up here. I can't do it. It's too much because all of this is on. But when you remove that attention, it's almost as if same thing, that demand goes down and able to sort of flow. So yeah, I see a massive crossover. Um, I see quite a lot of exposure anxiety in Lola actually. Um, sh she gets quite withdrawn if she feels like people are watching her. Um, <sighs> Max will go under the table. I mean, yeah. under the table, guaranteed under the table. Yeah, Lola would, um, she would just stop what she was doing. It, if, she, if she found something funny or good and she kind of came out of her shell a little bit too much and people yeah. were like, oh, you know, there's Lola. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's that attention, it's that reaction, that attention reaction. That yeah. All, and, that yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's have a look. Uh, Poppy, yeah, rewatch later. Poppy missed the um, beginning. She only saw the end. Simon says, thank you, Bobby. Very good. Tigger says, really interesting. Um, we'll be looking at the links, etc. So yeah, I mean, I can post the links. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy. Like I said, I'm happy for, for anybody to have the PDF or links or however you want to do it. You've got it. I've sent it to you. I can send it to oh, you. Okay. Time. Yeah, so you're I, happy for me to share that, are you? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Janice says, do you feel like anxiety is what drives this, just like it drives PDA? It's the attention. The attention builds. It's kind of a dull-edged sword. So I think, that, yeah, Max is definitely an anxious, um, autistic um, young, young man now. Um, but initially, it was the attention that brought the, it seemed to bring the anxiety up. So that's how I saw it but I can't see why it wouldn't be both, you know, because now with college, for example, anxiety is kind of triggering the EA, if that makes sense, yeah? Anxiety about going in, anxiety about COVID, anxiety about all of these are making those worries about attention being placed, unnecessary or perceived attention being placed. And that's kind of, I guess, a dual-edged sword. Yeah. They drive each other. Yeah, it, it's just like that merry-go-round, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the yeah. anxiety and the control and the demand yeah. avoidance. Yeah. yeah. Um, Victoria says she can't give any praise or draw attention to anything her daughter creates. It makes a lot of sense and she's never heard of EA before. Yeah. Um, Dean says, do you think EA is something that can be triggered by negative experiences from other people early on? Definitely. Definitely. Mm. In reference to like for school, you know, nursery nursery which torture at one point and I was in there for six months um at nursery with Max because Max could not handle um this one teacher at one point and I think it was possibly no through no fault of this teacher but I think this teacher kind of went in all positive and happy and it just triggered something in Max it was negative um so therefore you know from that point on it was I'm only going to stay if, if mom stays with me so yeah. I kind of think that it, yeah, it can, but, but, but not negative experiences that we would see as negative experience because, you know, a, a nursery a teacher being positive is not a negative thing, but to somebody with EA and all that attention being placed on, it would be. Yeah. Spotlight. Mm. Um, yeah, Karen, I will, um, I will put the presentation on the page later um, and anybody is welcome to share it or download it from there. If it isn't, I don't know how, to, I've not done a PDF online before, it should be fine. Um, yeah, that's, that's the problem, I don't know. <laughs> I'll do it. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, we'll work out another way. Karen says she found it um, very interesting and relatable. And then, uh 
Claire says so interesting and really hadn't thought about the toilet holding side of things and it really makes a lot of sense yeah yeah mm -hmm. I, that was a big thing for Max and I, I haven't really completely worked out how mm. um, but it it and I think I think it was because I went through the the normal sort of the things you do when you're potty training a child you know praise when and blah 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 and, and it just then it reversed it became holding now to this day max still won't go in public and will not go at college and wouldn't go in high school and it is it's about it's it's about perceived attention they think he thinks everybody's looking at him when he goes in there yeah now they know what i'm doing mm -hmm. i get that yeah so much like when I'm in a restaurant and I get up to go to the toilet, I'm like, oh my God, people know where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, no, there's an element of that. That's just it. That's just it. But, you know, you still go. Do, do you know what I mean? Whereas, whereas for, for, for Max and, and, and definitely for, for Paul um, and, and the couple of children that I worked with, that was just, yeah, that's not going to happen. Not going to do it. You know, and can you imagine the stomach aches? Can you imagine how that affects yeah. it? all day Ew. yeah big struggle yeah and it says when her daughter left her class of 10 and is now in a class of 24 she says she likes it more because the attention is not all on her exactly exactly yeah, yeah. i mean max dyes his hair purple yeah mm -hmm. and you think that that would be the opposite like why would you do that because attention would and he said it's because then i can think everybody thinks if they're looking at my hair Mm. Yeah, I can focus it. I can direct it into one thing that they're looking yeah. at. Makes sense. Yeah. Ian says it's like PDA ish. Don't demand that I'm the center of your attention. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that's why I think more research should go into it. I mean, and like I said, I, it, to me, I'm not trying to make this into something that's necessarily a, a completely bigger and different thing. But as you, as you, you know, you taught me, you were parenting a, a PDA child differently. You know, I, I had to parent Max very differently, you know, yeah. to, to a lot of other parents of autistic children, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you almost get that kind of exposure anxiety yourself when you transition from the traditional parenting methods to parenting a PDA child because you're thinking, oh my God, you know, and then people over there, they're thinking that I just let my child get away with everything. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> but eventually you become desensitised to that fact and you're like, do you know what? I don't care what anybody thinks of me. Yeah. My child, as long as my child is safe, happy, yeah. um, loved, then... And you know she's not hurt and no one she's not putting herself at risk then it doesn't matter that's why one time when, when you were talking about cursing um as as, as a, a mechanism in one of your lives with harry i was like oh yeah okay that resonates with me completely because you know we wouldn't stop him yeah like if he had to let go and he needed to get that out and that meant cursing okay it was a lot better than it was before because initially it would be hitting you mm. hitting you punching you then it became cursing and screaming when that didn't work it became running away yeah it, 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 the ante gets upped every yeah, time absolutely yeah absolutely and you have to find the balance between whether you're going to accept the cursing yeah. or um risk them making themselves or somebody else unsafe and you know if they want to stand there and say f-u-c-k to me then yeah. I'd rather that than them running the road and, and, and get right over. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I don't have, like, I am not a saint. <laughs> my, neither is my mother. We, you know, my mom looks like butter wouldn't melt, but my God, does she have a trucker's mouth? Yeah. And like, I learned that. So it's not, and I was really good when the kids were young. Like we didn't, you know, they didn't hear stuff, but eventually they're going to. And if that's the way Max wants to express himself, I'm certainly not going to stop them. You know what I mean? At home. Yeah. Simon's just made me die. He's put, is anyone going to ask about the cat? Yeah, the one that's screaming outside my door. Hold on. I have one too outside my door. There's two cats. Right. Yeah, let's see if he comes in. Come on. You've probably been me insane. Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come here. Say hi. Hi. Mine ran away. Thank goodness. There you go. Oh, look. He has no fur. Yes, no, this is Gunnar. Gunnar has absolutely no fur. He was adopted by a friend, in fact, an old teacher of Max's, um, who, whose daughter became highly allergic. You wouldn't think they'd be allergic to a 
cat yeah. we are. But yeah, this one was. So yeah, we have Max. And Max has been outside screaming his face off for the last 10 minutes. He's still going to look. What do you want, cat? Come on. Yes, I know. You're going to say hi. You're going to say hi. <gasps> do you hear the kitty cat? Oh, oh, oh got to look. Seriously. Yeah, he's too busy about like wondering what's going on. Cuddles. Yeah. He just wants his food. He eats about a hundred times a day. Yeah, so does he. he because they don't have um, fur, they're a lot more, don't even think about jumping on me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he eats like three times the amount of my black cat. This is my cuddle. Oh, sweet arms. We look alike. We've got the same hair color now. <laughs> <laughs> when they owners start to look like their pet. Uh, that'll be me one day when I'm bald, you know. <laughs> oh, cats, eh? Can't yeah. be with us and they can't be without us. I mean, he's wonderful when I'm actually having a flare up. It's funny how he knows because he's yeah. pretty much guaranteed plastered beside me and he's really warm. <laughs> My own pot hot water bottle. Yeah, lovely. Oh, I love a hot water bottle. Mm, definitely. No, Simon, you weren't hearing things. In actual fact, I thought I was hearing things too, because when my cat wasn't there, I could still hear the cat. So I was like... That's mine. Where is the cat? <laughs> he's now sitting on top of my hard drive because it's nice and warm. But yeah, he's oh. loud, really loud. And cat every time we go outside, we'll leave. Heaven forbid I go anywhere. He's literally hanging outside my window, screaming at me as I pull away. <laughs> Karen says, is there anything to do with EA that may be connected to seeming to deliberately want to win a debate over a particular point or see the reaction in others, upset or anger, stay detached and win? Hmm. Can you read that again? Yeah. So is there anything to do with exposure anxiety that may be connected to seeming to deliberately want to win a debate over a particular point or see the reaction in others and still stay detached and win even if the other person's upset or angry? No, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing a connection as such. I have to be honest, I'm not saying there isn't one. Um, but for me, it would be, if you've won a debate, then the attention would be placed on that person. So the person who's won the debate, if they have EA, they wouldn't want to win it because it would have the attention with them, unless, unless they were in a very safe space and could literally be themselves. Yeah. But if they, if, if they're suffering from EA and, and attention, um, you know, that's, that's why Max would never raise his hand in class. You know, that's why, you know, he yeah. could, he knew the answer. There were many times he knew the answer, but he couldn't even say it. It was almost like a, um, a, a mutism came over. You know, there was no way he was so saying that. So just asked, actually, is there a link with that and SM? SM. Um, selective mutism. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in that respect, I would. Because because there were times when when Max would literally shut down. And like, like I said, after... But AI got to the point uh, with Max that um, instead of like hitting or cursing or screaming or any of that stuff, he just stopped engaging. Yeah. It would be a child completely shut down. Didn't matter what you did, didn't, no matter how much you tried, didn't matter, you could not get in. It, they completely would be shut down. So yeah, and, and shut down in all senses. So, you know, you'd be talking and, and, and Max would appear as if he couldn't hear you. You know, you'd, uh, you'd want him to speak and there was no way he was going to be able to speak. Mm. You know? So, yeah, I would think there, there, yeah, I would think there's definitely instances where somebody with EA would just go completely mute. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Please don't start climbing my bookcase. Oh, God, here we go. Is there ever, Dan, uh, sorry, Dean Beadle says, is there ever a time where you can make attention feel safe? Yeah, when the person knows you really well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and now at 19, Max will come to me with anything, like the most personal details, details that I'm like, okay, you can hold on to that a little bit longer. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it, yeah, when they, when they are really comfortable with somebody and they trust them, trust is huge. They trust you. Yeah. 
then that exposure anxiety is probably not his place. Now, when, when Max was younger, that was different because everything was new, you know? So any attention and all attention was, was hard. Now it's more the attention of people he doesn't know. Mm. Yeah. Or maybe doesn't trust. As yeah. Well. So, um, Definitely those he doesn't know. So how would you say he's like, has he found his own techniques? Did you give him techniques? How did you learn about it together? And how did you manage to, you know, kind of arm him with the tools to be able to function outside when he isn't with his safe people? Yeah, I'm, I'm, he's, I guess being in, in a, I'm going to close this door a little bit because now I'm going to go deep. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, so I think being in a in a house where we are all probably neurodivergent, yeah, and and very very good chance that um you know my my, my husband pretty much says he's, he thinks he's autistic. I know I definitely am. Um, my my eldest is definitely definitely close, whether diagnosed or not, I don't know, but close. But regardless, the point is that we are very very very. Uh, we used to say we're like crazy. We're the crazy family because anything kind of goes with us in that respect. So it's always been me never lying, always being brutally honest, even if it hurt, yeah. um, has built up a massive amount of trust. Me learning about autism, doing my autism degree, learning about exposure, anxiety, all of these things, as I learned them, I kind of took Max along with me, age appropriately, of course. Yeah. Now at 19, um, it's almost as if he's taking it upon himself to confront it himself. So college, give you an example real quick. Um, went into induction, two day induction, first day induction went in. Uh, we were like, whoa, whoa, yay, okay. And it was because he decided this is what he was going to do and he was yeah. gonna handle it as best he could. Um, and you know, we were by the phone and, and waiting and lunchtime comes along and no call. And then all of a sudden it's one o'clock and I got a text and it was gonna come pick me up. Well, the induction went until about three, four o'clock. Well, uh, totally impressed that he lasts that long. They threw two um, tests, assessment tests on them and a group um, activity. And uh, by that point, he was like, I can't handle. Because by the time he got to the group activity with other people, the exposure anxiety was screaming blue murder. Because he was in a room with people he didn't know very well at all, obviously. Um, so he shut down, came home. And then it was, I can't go back, I can't go back, I can't go back. But, there's a part of him that knows he needs to go back. So between him and his teacher, they've worked out online. So every class is accessed between uh, uh, on Google Meets online. And the teacher is smart enough, turn the camera so that Max can see everybody in the room. Yeah, to get familiar, more familiar with who's there, who's, you know what I mean? Um, all the what work that they're doing is online. So they're seeing each other's work. Mm -hmm. And because Max is now in a position where he's feeling safe, the exposure anxiety is going right down and, and and consequently he's sharing things and 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 doing things that we didn't think were possible so were there any tips and tr tricks along the way no we kind of learned together yeah now he's kind of doing it himself he's confronting it himself in his own way he knows that we've got his back regardless so i think that is more than anything else huge yeah so it doesn't matter if he tries something and it doesn't go the way he planned you know we we are still saying we got you back. It's okay. Doesn't matter. So maybe yeah, I've heard the same with Stanley this week. Um, he he's really struggling this week. I think he's kind of realizing that year nine isn't a barrel of laughs anymore, and you know he has to worry. You know, it's a, a lot more effort that he needs to put in to get the grades out. But Stanley is of the very understandable mindset that he shouldn't have to prove that he knows everything and it's very difficult to explain to him that he isn't proving it to the teachers he's proven it to himself if you like so that he can get those grades you know yeah it, it's and but he's he's so he's so set on the fact that I think he feels like people are just trying to trick him just to get work out of him. Um, and he he's really struggled this week with um, going into school and he's he's just been so down, bless him. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough. 
it's really tough because it, because it, school isn't made up. It's not set for our neurodivergent kids. Let's be really yeah. honest about it. You know, the education system doesn't even follow um, child development, let alone, because if it did, they'd be allowed to play a lot, heck of a lot more earlier on for longer than they're actually allowed to, if you, you know what I mean? So it, 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 I office often think if I won the lottery and joke with a couple of friends of mine, if I won the lottery, the first thing I would open is school and it would be completely different to anything else. Like it would be a lot more free range because yeah. I think that's how our autistic kids learn. Yeah. You know? I don't think it, I don't think they learn by forcing things down and force feeding them to perform and to comply. You know no. what I mean? It's, and, it's, and, and that generation's passed now. You know, it, it's happened. Yeah. It's been. It's gone. We've yeah. proved that it it didn't work. Yeah. Let's try something new. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I totally agree. Absolutely. So. Um, Marianne says, can EA, PDA happen from emotions or perceptions getting entangled with other people's emotions and, and sensations? Well, definitely can for EA if, 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 if that person is codependent, because then, then they don't know what, because, because EA, I, I don't know necessarily about PDA, PDA as much, but I know EDA, or EA, excuse me, EDA, EA is, um, it's almost like an, another entity. It's like another person living in that person that says, no, but I'm the real, I'm, I'm you. I'm, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to be always be there for you. So in that aspect, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think about PDA? Oh, um, I'm going to have to read that question again. Yeah, I'm starting to get tired. Sorry. <laughs> I'm agreeing with you. That's why I just passed it right back to you. Oh. Can EA PDA happen from emotions and perceptions getting into? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you know, you you know, people don't just when you have PDA, you're not just avoiding demands that people place upon you. you um, the demand avoidance is consistent across any and all setting, mm -hmm. um, emotion, behavior, person, you know, self-made demands. Yeah. You know, um, even if Lola desperately wants to do something, yes. sometimes she just cannot bring herself to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, I mean, you just you just triggered something in me the first time Max was asked to go to an expo. Wanted to go. It was a game. Yeah. So wanted to go. Wanted to go, wanted to go, wanted to go. But then when they thought about all the people that were there, couldn't do it. And afterwards, yeah. I regret. You know, and then that's when my heart breaks because then he spends his time beating himself up for not going. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Lola, she, Lola's desperate to do gymnastics. She yeah. always has been. She attended a class when she was younger, about um, five or six. And she, she really struggled because I wasn't allowed in there with her um, because it was the older session. Um, you know, parents don't join five and six year olds anymore. So mummy has to wait outside. So she kind of gave that up quite quickly. Um, in fact, we're used to um, paying for activities outright and then only doing like one session and, and having to give it up because it's just so difficult for her. Yeah. But she started again doing a gymnast class where Connie goes. So she goes in, Connie goes in and then Loda goes in, which is the huge demand for Lola because that means she has to come in the car with me. She has to wait for an hour until Connie finishes, yeah. um, which isn't great for her. She likes to be, you know, able to be free range, like you just said. Um, and, you know, she was having to kind of be quiet and not disturb them. But of course she wanted to poke her head in and, and stuff like that. So she done one session and she didn't go back again. Wow. Um, and then the other day we would, I was taking Connie and Kenny weren't here to look after Lola. So of course Lola had to come with me. Um, and that's where I say, um, we use our non-negotiables because we don't have any rules. We don't have consequences, but I couldn't leave her at home. It wasn't safe. I'd probably be told off for social, with social services if I did so, in which case that demand became a non-negotiable. She had to come in the car with me. Yeah. And so as soon as she knew that, you know, she was coming, whether she liked it or not, she was changed in her gymnastics kit. She was going to gymnasts wow. um, and she waited for an hour for Connie and she sat in my car and she'd done some homework and then she went into a gymnast class and done a four hour session. Wow. 
uh, brilliant. And I said to her when she came out, are you going to go again, Lola? And she was like, yeah. Wow, that's brilliant. Time tell, but um, yeah, hope, you know, some, sometimes um, the kind of demand cycle with um, extracurricular activities just needs to be broken a little bit. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, once once you know, I wasn't forcing her to do gymnastics, so I wasn't making yeah. her come with me to do that. Yeah, you know, it the the pressure had gone. There was no yeah. demand for her apart from the fact she had to wait for Connie, and so yeah, yeah, yeah then it became easy. Yeah, easy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Um. So wow. this has been amazing. Thank what you. can we talk about next time? Ooh. Would okay, you like yeah. to join us again? Yes. Amazing. Yeah, let's yeah, get you booked in then. Definitely. Thank we'll have a chat later. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would love to hear more. This has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll speak later. Bye, everybody. If you've got any Bye. questions, put them in the comments. And I will share the presentation probably tomorrow morning. Right on. Thank Bye. -bye. You. Bye. <laughs>